Good morning and welcome to our science symposium. You may be seated. The task is mine to inspire you with a thought. And in thinking about what to share, I just remember a video presentation that I watched quite recently. And it was referring to the fact that the LED lights that we have today, the blue LED light, really changed the way things are today. And there is a scientist by the name of Shuji Nakamura. And he's Japanese, and he's now Japanese-American. But, but for years, they came up with the red LED light first, and that followed with the, the green one, but no one could figure out how to make blue light. Now, if you think that an LED light is just about, you know, what we have as our typical incandescent lights or some of the other light systems that we have, it's not so. It is really about moving electrons. All of that stuff that people have learned in chemistry about electrons moving from one shell to another and causing energy to be given off. That is how LEDs work. But they could not for years figure out how to get blue light. And so 30 years after the first invention of the LED light, there was a scientist by the name of this, this guy here, Suji Nakamura, and he decided, because his company was not doing so well, he decided to go to his boss and to say, look, we can try to make this blue LED light, but I need funding. So they gave him three million US dollars at the time. And he went to America, he spent a few months there, and while he was there, because he wasn't a PhD, he did, he did his bachelor's degree in engineering, he did his master's degree in engineering, but he was you know, working for this company making semiconductors, and they weren't doing so well. So he understood the basics, but he wanted to expand his knowledge, so he went to America where they had a machine that was able to create this layer of crystal that, on which they built the, the technology of LEDs. But while he was there, they, they mistreated him because he didn't have a PhD. And so they gave him the old machine to work on while the new technology was there. And while he was there, he had to spend every day um, building it, fixing it up, modifying it to make it work. And in that process, he learned a lot about the technology. He went back to Japan with a receipt in his hand for a brand new machine. And while he was there, he set up his lab and he, he set himself to work day in, day out. For one year, every day, he was in his lab. And from morning till evening, he would try. And he would also spend time listening to what's going on in terms of the, the research work that was going on. The theme this year looks at the concept of embracing this new technology that's coming out and trying to make it work. So he, he spent the time looking into the technology and tinkering with his brand new machine and even modifying it to, to work with something that people were discovering. There were two ideas at the time. One was zinc selenide and the other one was gallium nitride. Everyone was doing zinc selenide. Everyone was going in that direction and he decided, look, if I am going to make some progress, I have to try something different because he had to publish papers in order to get his PhD. Five papers, that's what was necessary in Japan. And so he said, I'm going to go in the opposite direction where people are not looking because everybody gave up on the technology. And he went in the direction of gallium nitride. And while he went in that direction, he learned a lot of things from other Japanese. There were two others at the Nagoya City University. I've actually visited that university, really big in technology. Um, there were two researchers there doing something along the same line. They were looking at the gallium nitride while everybody else in the world was looking towards zinc selenide. And it took about 30 years to develop the technology that we take for granted nowadays. Every single day. And once he got the blue light and was able to, because when he got it, it was dim. Actually, there was someone before who had come up with a blue light, but it was so dim that the company scrapped it. It takes perseverance. It takes effort. It takes energy to take what is new and improve on it. 
Now, that company, Nishia, in Japan, is making billions of dollars. Now, we have all of these systems of LED lights all over the world. Actually, he had to move from Japan to America because his company really didn't give him much for his effort. And now he is at a university in California, and there he has now developed what is called micro LEDs. The technology is moving forward because in his mind he cannot stop. He cannot cease until he finds a solution. That is what science is. That is what science requires. It doesn't require us to just do what everybody else is doing. It requires us to improve on what is there, to take what exists and to find new ways of doing it. I move to another story in the scriptures. And by the way, I should say that while he was there in, in Japan, when he went to America, they were saying, well, he doesn't have a PhD, he doesn't know anything. So he said he went back and he only needed five papers. By the time he got that technology developed, he had 15 papers. Now he has over 500 papers published. Now he has many types of technologies that we use on the market on a regular basis. I turn to Nehemiah in the Bible. And Nehemiah had the burden on him because when he looked at Jerusalem, the walls were in a bad state. And he thought to himself, look, I need to do something about this. I need to. And so the king, when he saw him with his countenance just falling, he said, look, what's going on? What's wrong with you? And he said, look, things are not good in Israel. I need to fix things. And so the king gave him some resources and sent him to Jerusalem. But when he started, he had to inspire people to get on board. And once he inspired people to get on board and he started the progress, there was this guy named Sanballat, I don't know if you know the story, who just jumped on board and tried to prevent him from moving forward. I use the story to let you know that in this, in this world, there are people who will encourage you. And at the same time, there are people who will discourage you. But nevertheless, like Nakamura, like Nehemiah, Nehemiah, push forward. If you have a concept in your mind that seems like it is impossible now, if you keep moving forward, there's a possibility that the impossible might become possible. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 11, there is a familiar story. And it reads, Genesis 11 verse 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. This is what we refer to now as the Tower of Babel and the city and tower of Babel. Whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What is it that is on your mind? What is it that weighs down your thoughts? What scientific principles are you now developing? What is it that you imagine that is impossible? Because when this, this scientist decided, this engineer decided to make a blue LED, it was impossible. When he continued to try, you know what they said when he was in his lab? When he was in his lab tinkering, people got used to hearing explosions in his lab because of phosphorus leaks. And they, they got so used to it that when they would hear an explosion, they were like, oh, that's just, that's just Shoji doing something. He got used to the fact in his lab that he had to go through all kinds of trials and tribulations and difficulties in order for him to achieve his goal in order for him to come up with the science that he needed, in order for him to design. And now, he has not stopped. So I want to end with a challenge from James chapter 5. And the challenge to you is, what do you do with the knowledge that you have? What do you do with the wealth that you've created? What do you do in the end? Because, you know, nowadays, there, somebody was telling me about it the other day I was trying to look it up but they were saying this this 
the CEO for, I think it's Honeycrust in America, shot himself. There was another individual recently, and he was a, a billionaire. Both of these individuals are billionaires, and they shot themselves after, you know, all of these years of, of just making money. I can assure you that Nakamaru, Nakamura has no intention to kill himself because he is following a dream. He is living a principle. If you develop something and build it and grow with it and your, your focus is not about money, it's just about learning and improving our knowledge, there's no reason to take your life. So the challenge I give you, go to now, ye rich men. This is James chapter 5. I'm reading just a few verses. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped up treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of, you, of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the days of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. The challenge to us today is not to focus on wealth and riches, is not to focus on having things, because as you can see here, the challenge to these individuals who have gained much wealth is that everything you have is going to be worth nothing. Everything you have is going to even cause you great pain. How many of us have seen clothes in our closet since COVID with moth holes in it? I remember I have a black suit and I certainly didn't wear it today because it has some holes in it from moths because it's been sitting in my closet during COVID and I didn't go out much and do much with it. So it was there and it actually got these moth holes in it and I found one or two pieces of clothing that have these moth holes in it. If you have so many things that you have no time to use them, if you have so many things that you have no time to develop them and share them and all your focus is is money, the Bible's warning is that it will come to naught. So as scientists, as individuals who have access to knowledge, spend your time acquiring it and spend your time developing it but don't make your efforts focus on making just money from it. This world needs people. This world needs scientists. This world needs innovators. This world needs individuals who are willing to push the limits on reality and to try something new. And so my hope is that as we progress this year, some young person will be inspired to try something different. Some individual in here will think about the world differently and find something that you can put your focus on and grow and develop in. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your continuous mercies and your blessings on us. We thank you for the privilege that we have to think and to reason and to innovate. We thank you for the privilege that we have to even be at a university where there should be opportunities made available for students and even faculty to develop their skills and their talents and their resources. May we learn to use this wonderful tool that we have in our heads called the brain. May we learn to develop concepts. And most of all, God, may we learn to trust you to lead us in the right path. May these proceedings today bring glory to your name. I pray in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the 24th staging of Sands Symposium. I want to thank you for joining us here at the gym at Northern Caribbean University. I am Dr. Nicole White, the chair of the Department of Biology, Chemistry, and Environmental Science, who 
or the department that is hosting the Science Symposium this year and every year. The theme for this 2024 symposium is Embracing Novel Research Evidence, Excellence in Harmonious Edified Lifeways. During the course of the day, we will see researchers from various departments within NCU. Yes, your very lecturers will be showcasing their research to you. You will also see posters, hopefully, from some high school students who have been invited to share with us today. We have a keynote speaker that is coming to us from Loma Linda University, Dr. Penelope, and I'm hoping I get the last name right, Dirksen Hughes. She will be introduced by our very president, Dr. Lincoln Edwards. Around midday, we will pause for a book launch of our very own Professor Mark Harris. He teaches or lectures in the geography program, so I know our geography students would love to see that. The theme or the title of his book is The Science of Global Warming Remediation. A very timely title, a very timely book, seen as what's going on globally. As we open Science Symposium 2024, I pray that we are all truly edified in what is being brought to us. I pray that all our students from BCES or faculty staff at Northern Caribbean University or external visitors will remember today, will want to come back, will want to share with us, as this is not just an NCU event, we want it to be a big event, an international event. So, thank you again for coming and welcome on behalf of BCES. As I exit, I invite Professor Paul Giles to come to the podium. Thank you very much, Dr. White. Director of Research, Dr. Frankson, Dean of the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health and Nursing, Professor Vincent Wright, our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Hughes, Chair of the Biology and Chemistry Department, Dr. White, lecturers, presenters, faculty members, visitors, Ladies and gentlemen, pleasant good morning. At the heart of developing nations, science and technology, which involves quite often research and development along with innovation. Due to the necessity of such foundational tools, governments set the pace by investing in this area from which organizations and private sector take the button by giving support and developing infrastructure to support this vital area. In spite of the world challenges, Northern Caribbean University is determined to popularize science and technology along with teaching and research so that students can embrace this knowledge and be able to shine in this time of digital technology. Through research, we have new products, improved products, new methods, new ideas. And because Northern Caribbean University has embraced this, we have made inroads in many areas, in the areas of natural products, in the areas of agriculture, in the area of agronomy, DNA technology, biotechnology, we have placed ourselves in key positions by the research that we have done. And I want to say that Northern Caribbean University is making a big difference in central Jamaica. We have led out in sharing and teaching and directing farmers what to do 
uh, through lectures and through seminars and through workshops. So Northern Caribbean University has established itself as a key player and we understand and we are giving support to the communities that we have. Because of our commitment, this science symposium has continued over the past 24 years. And today, I hope we'll have stimulating presentations that are geared towards encouraging practitioners and interested persons to continue to build on the science and technology infrastructure and legacy that we have established. God is a source of all wisdom and he has established Northern Caribbean University to be a beacon flying the flag of technology, research and development to enhance those in Jamaica and the societies and around the world. We believe we ought to impact the world. Our involvement in technology, IT technology, cancer research, all these things, we have been playing our part and we will continue uh, to do this. And this science symposium sets the tone for continued work. I invite all today to digest all the presentations and prepare to implement the knowledge we gain in our various spheres. May God bless you as we participate as presenters, listeners, and philosophers as we try to unravel the mysteries of research which is directed by godly influence. Best wishes to all as we participate in this science symposium. Thank you very much, Professor Giles, for those words. And I just want to greet everyone to our science symposium. I hope it will be a rewarding one for each one that is present here today. It is with great pride that I extend greetings to all faculty, staff, students, researchers, and visitors to our science symposium. Within, whether your presentation showcasing your latest discovery, visiting from other institutions or even individuals who are curious about activities in the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health and Nursing, we are happy to have you. This science symposium serves as a platform for us to showcase research being conducted within our college and fostering collaboration. Professor Mark Harris will be launching his new book entitled The Science of Global Warming and Remediation later on today. And I want to commend him and look forward for more persons within the college to, act, to be actively engaged in book writing and more publication. Research plays an important role in academia. There are some areas we would like to focus on, such as agriculture. Agriculture plays a very important role in these last days. All of us inside here rely on agriculture. We are relying on food. Without food, we cannot perform. So we here at NCU thought best that we should direct our thoughts on agriculture. Currently, with the war in the Middle East, <clears throat> USA plan to provide two million persons with food on a daily basis in Palestine. And this is going to take a lot. Because of climate change, water level in the Swiss Canal and Panama Canal and the Mississippi River 
has fallen significantly. And as a result of that, all of you sitting before me here, you have to pay the price in one way or another. You were to go to Mandeville Market right now as I speak, you will have to pay probably two to three hundred dollars per pound for yam. One planting is being sold for, for over a hundred dollars. One finger of planting over a hundred dollars. One breadfruit is being sold for eight hundred to a thousand dollars. And I could go on and on with price increase. So as a result of that, we think agriculture is a very important area and we want to direct our attention, more focus on agriculture. As a result of that, we are going to be doing more research in the area of agriculture. In addition to that, in the past, we have work with the breadfruit, for example, the breadfruit plant where we have established the Swift River watershed in Portland. And as a result of that, it is bearing fruit. Every day I'm getting call from farmers requesting seedlings, and it, it, is, it has protected the watershed to a great extent. As a result of that, two Jamaicans who live in the United States, they have taken the breadfruit trees and the breadfruit plant to a number of developing and poor countries. And as a result of that, they are creating a lot of strife. Trees that feed. Look, if you go on your website, you will find them. Trees that feed. So it has played a very important role. It started right here at this university. In the past, we have also looked at things like heavy metals, mined out bauxite land which has gained international recognition. Professor Giles and Dr. Penrod from Oakwood University has pioneered the sorrel drink, whereby you can obtain your sorrel drink now in almost any supermarket in Jamaica, and it has a lot of nutritional benefit, and it has gained some amount of international recognition. Research has been conducting conducted in areas of nutraceutical and as a result of that we realize the potential and these are some of the areas we are open to embark on at this university as a university we are anticipating to conduct more research in the area of computer science engineer and the whole business of the environmental science we are encouraging faculty and graduates, students, to get involved. New students who want to be engaged in some of these areas, you can talk to the chair of your various department within the college. In the area of community and adult education, we are open to provide training as well in areas of hydroponic, Right now, we are training community members in the area of hydroponic, greenhouse technology, horticulture, and such like. To our presenters and keynote speaker, I extend my sincere gratitude to you for your invaluable insight. Your presence today will surely enrich our symposium and make significant contribution to our field and the society at the large. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and I hope you will have a very productive and rewarding day. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. It is certainly a delight to be here this morning and to be the chair of this first session for this forum of the NCU Symposium 2024. As scientifically minded people, we are undoubtedly aware of the power of hypothetical conjecture and of scientific inquiry. And so I'm sure 
that you are as excited as I am to ponder, to engage, and to assimilate some of the latest scientific exploits inter alia from our corner of the hemisphere this morning. At this point, without any further ado, I'm going to be in, um, welcoming our first speaker to come to the podium to do his presentation. It will be Mr. Fabian Pitkin. He is chair of the Department of Medical Technology here at Northern Caribbean University, and we are just delighted to hear from him this morning. Let's give him a round of applause. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Wellington. And a special welcome to those of, of you who are joining us online. This morning, I want to explore with you a study that was done on ethylene diamide tetraacetic acid induced thrombocytopenia, a case report. Ethylene diamide tetraacetic acid induced thrombocytopenia. All right, so EDTA for short, EDTA for short, EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia is a, is a fairly rare disorder that occurs within the test system. So essentially, it does not occur within the, the, the body. It occurs while the sample or blood is collected in the test tube or the collection tube system. It is immunologic, Im, immu, it's an immunological mediated phenomena characterized by falsely low platelet counts on automated analyzers secondary to antiplatelet antibodies creating aggregates of platelets resulting in this very low platelet count. The aggregation of the platelets cause several other changes in the complete blood count um, values. So aggregation of platelets result in elevation or false elevation in your leukocytes because the aggregates of these platelets are measured, measured as lymphocytes. What do we have? Failure to detect this phenomenon could result in unnecessary laboratory investigations and superfluous interventions by physicians or other members of the healthcare team. So we, did, we had a case of a 23-year-old female who, who presented with this, this phenomenon, falsely elevated leukocytes, and we confirmed that this was indeed the EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia phenomenon because we collected samples in a situated tube or blue-top tube, and the results re revealed normal platelet counts and normal lymphocyte, leukocyte counts, and a peripheral smear that was devoid of any aggregation. So let's look deeper into this um, phenomenon. So it's EDTA is a EDTA induced thrombocytopenia is, an, is very uncommon and requires distinct and different dif distinction and differentiation from other disease conditions that are characterized by very low platelet counts and presence of platelet aggregates. In more recent times, with the outbreak of the dengue virus, we had many persons coming down with very low platelet counts, aggregation, 
And of course, this was in direct relation to the immunological changes induced by the viral infection, causing the, anti the formation of antiplated antibodies and subsequent aggregation of platelets. All right? We must be vigilant in detecting this disorder in the clinical laboratory. If we're not vigilant, then the patients are going to spend large sums of monies to do further investigation when it calls for a critical eye, critical thinking, and fast-acting medical technologists and, clinician, and other clinicians to detect this disorder. So even though it's, this disorder is seen in patients with known malignancies and other dis and disorders, it has been observed in normal patients. Approximately 2% of our population. The hallmark feature here is thrombocytopenia with platelet aggregate or aggregation. The aggregates are not counted as platelets by automated analyzers, and you wonder why not find an alternative. Platelet measurements are primarily done by analyzers. On rare occasions, when platelet count is, is low, sometimes um, we might take the, the approach of using, going the manual route, and that is very time consuming as against going the um, measuring using analyzers. The phenomenon can be detected on platelet histogram and subsequent manual review of peripheral smear for the presence of the giant platelets and other forms of platelet aggregates. EDTA, ethylene diamide tetraacetic acid, is a commonly used anticoagulant in, our, in, in the lab. And it, it is a chelator, means that it binds calcium to prevent the formation and resulting in the formation of calcium salts, allowing the blood to remain anticoagulated, meaning there's no clotting um, in the testing in the tube system. And this gives excellent preservation of cellular components. You ask, why not use other anticoagulants? EDTA is a gold standard. It's a, it's, it's, it's a gold standard for preservation of the formed elements within the blood. This disorder can be detected early, but if the results are not properly analyzed, the, if the medical technologist, the physician does not interpret and analyze this, the, the data properly, it could lead to misdiagnosis of patients and, mis and undesired financial constraints to patients and, could un could, and other interventions like unnecessary transfusion and other, other diagnostic test testing. I think about um, a recent case, a recent case where the patient was asked to do a bone marrow, bone marrow aspirate to actually evaluate the health of the bone marrow and the, the, particularly the platelets, or what should I say, stand correctly, the megakaryocytes within the bone marrow. And of course, um, such an intervention is, was, was not necessary because of the, the, the other presentations. So let's look at our case, the case that we had. 23-year-old 20, female of Afro-Caribbean um, descent, and she was referred to her primary care physician because of this thrombocytopenia that was detected, um, doing a complete blood count and differential. She was asymptomatic. What am I talking about? She didn't present with any form of coagulopathy. She didn't have any bleeding disorders or anything. No history of drug, drug usage or recent infection. There was no history of weight loss, melano, Melena, meaning stool that is black, cor corresponding with um, upper gastrointestinal bleed. There is no nose bleed. There is no bleeding under the skin, evidenced by petiche ecchymosis, right, or purpura. And her family history, physical and systemic examinations were 
awesome. She was in good health. What then is the problem, you ask? The initial complete blood count revealed normal parameters from alarming low, apart from the alarming low platelet count, her platelet count was 18,000. A normal platelet count is 150,000 to 450,000. So of course, a platelet count of 18,000 becomes extremely what? Alarming. Yes. Um, outside of this phenomenon, a person with a platelet count of of 18,000 will bleed to death. A, a, platelet, a platelet count of 18,000, 18, that person gets a small uh, injury, a small cut, and that results in severe bleeding. The peripheral smear was subsequently reviewed, and it revealed that the platelet, there were platelet aggregates and moderate amount of giant platelets. So, the physician with the team from the laboratory postulated that the low platelet count was due to EDTA platelet aggregation, and this was confirmed with normal platelets from, from normal platelets, normal leukocyte counts from specimen collected in a situated tube or blue top tube. The, our platelet was two, 259,000, and that's a big difference between what, 18,000, right? Is that correct? Yes, major difference. And of course, her white cell count was, her leukocyte count, her white cell count was 8.6, a reference range of 4.8 to 10 point, sorry, 4.8 to 10.8. So, and a peripheral smear that was devoid of any form of platelet aggregates. Let's look at, look at it in more detail. So, EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia is also called pseudothrombocytopenia, right? Or EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia. And we have established that it is result, direct result of platelet autoantibodies that recognizes the platelet antigens modified by EDTA. Let me remind you, EDTA is still the gold standard for preservation of your formed elements or the, the, the elements within the blood or the cells within the blood. These antiplatelet antibodies are usually of one of two class, IgG or IgM. And really, um, we find some that are of the IgA class. And they recognize the, platelet anti the antigens on the platelets or the platelet membrane and as they are modified by the, the EDTA. And in contrast to serious and potential life-threatening causes, um, results in the thrombocytopenia. EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia is solely an in vitro effect without any clinical relevance, essentially taking place only in the collection tube. All right? The chelation, the, chelate, the chelation, the cation chelation by EDTA leads to conformational changes within the platelet membrane GP2B3A complex, unmasking the cryptic, com um, unmasking the epitope that becomes accessible for autoantibodies. What happens? This leads to platelet clumping or aggregation, and of course, the formation of giant platelets. And these giant platelets, as mentioned earlier, would have been um, detected or uh, um, computed as lymphocytes. The analyzers count the resulting platelet clumps as single giant platelets or small lymphocytes in the white blood cell aperture, which may result in slightly elevated white blood cell count the phenomenon is present in both healthy subjects and in patients with various uh, malignancies, and the incidences, incidence has been reported to be approximately 09 to 0.21%. This study was done in 2000 and, 2000 and in two, between 2017 and 2019, and the new stats is now that it's moved from, from that small percentage to now 2% or more. So we are, the incidence have been, are in, has increased significantly in, um, in our population.
All right. It is necessary for clinicians to consider the possible presence of, of this, this phenomenon in cases with patients having low platelet counts without any hemorrhagic tendencies as observed in our case. Right? Patient was asymptomatic. Unrecognized ED, um, EDTA thrombocytopenia may result in unnecessary diagnostic testing and clinical concerns. A microscopic examination can identify platelet clumps and a repeat CBC test, uh, test using a different anticoagulant can confirm the diagnosis. But you ask Mr. Pitkin, why not use citrated tubes um, perpetually since it yields a, corrected, um, platelet, a correct platelet count? The irony about it is that citrated tubes do major damage to the sensitive hematology automation and as such, in, in fact, once you use a saturated tube on those instruments, you will have to flush the instrument to remove the excess um, re the residue of, the, of the, the sodium citrate as it causes corrosion of certain metals, metal components of the instrument and by extension um, degrade the quality of the tubing in those instruments. Again, I say EDTA is still the one gold standard. In this case, we were able to confirm EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia with the use of the citrated tube and review of the peripheral smear. Additionally, we observed also that, that there was a significant reduction in what? The leukocyte count. According to one source, the best technique for obtaining accurate, accurate platelet counts in this phenomenon is to collect and examine the blood at 37 degrees Celsius, according to Celsius, 2007. This approach, however, has proven to be has not proven to be effective, as there have been reports that the platelet clumping still is present in about 20 percent of what the patients. So, where do we go? With sophisticated approaches to preventing EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia, such as addition of things such as aminoglycosides, it does exist for developing countries, or should I say developed countries, with the utilization of the, we know um, developing countries will use the, the citrated tube and use a dilution correction of a factor of 1.1. What are you talking about, Mr. Pitkin? So the citrated, citrated tube has an, a large amount of anticoagulant that significantly dilutes the blood. And in order to get the appropriate, the correct platelet count, we must multiply by the dilution factor of 1.1. I remember doing this presentation at, at, at another institution. And persons were up to, to go with the citrate the, situ the measurements from the situated tube. However, they did not do the volume correction or the dilution correction to get the actu accurate value for the, the platelet count. All right, moving forward. Let's talk about other, other tools that are essential in detecting and bringing conclusion to this issue. Histograms. So once you measure any, do a, a cell count measurement on any autom automated instrument, you get a, a, a histogram. What are histograms, you ask? Histograms are essential graphical representation of numerical data of different cell populations on an analyzer. The number of cells are, are, is represented on the y-axis while the size of the cells are represented on the x-axis. They are produced from thousands, and in some cases, depending on the sophistication of the instrument, millions of signals generated as the cells pass through the apertures. Histograms provide information on the distribution of various formed elements within the blood, uh, as well as subpopulations. So you can, if you have fragmented cells, the, the, the instruments are able to pick it up, pick, detect this on the Instagram, on the histogram. A shift in one direction or 
another can say much about the diagnosis of the patient and the possible interventions a medical technologist might need to make. The analysis of the histogram provide valuable information on specimen as well as the instrument itself. So let's quickly look at an example of a platelet histogram. This one represents the normal um, bell curve for platelets, where we have the PL, which is the lower discriminant, and PU, which is the upper discriminant. I won't bore you with this, but this comes in handy. Please remember what normal look, a normal histogram looks like as we emphasize the point. All right? So this is what the normal looks like. Good. Here we have PL, where there is a shift to the what? To the, to the lower discriminant. All right? And And, of course, it tells you that something is off with the platelet count. Then we have a shift to the, the, to the, the right here. All right. Let's look at, and then we have what we consider as multiple peaks. All right. And this, and we here, I tell you much about what's happening here. Um, well, let's look at some more details. Let's put, the, put them together. So if we have... A peak, if we have a peak or a spike at the left end of the histogram, that would, is as a result of RBC fragments. RBC fragments are not platelets. And we see this in cases where there are disorders where the, the cells are fragmenting and it causes a falsely, false elevation in your platelets. That's a twist. All right? Disorders such as chronic lymphocytic le leukemia, where the cells are actually... Um, where the cells are fragile and result in significant amount of fragmentation. Then we have a spike towards the right of the histogram. We see these in schistocytes where there's a hemolytic process and cells are, are being <coughs> destroyed intravascularly. And of course, microcytes. And here we have it, giant platelets and, and platelet aggregation. And bimodal peak, we'll see it in um, where there are plasma fragments. So our interest, though, is in the shift to the right. Let's go back. Remember what normal looks like? All right. So here we have normal. And once we have platelet aggregation and the presence of giant platelets, then we, we have a movement to the Right, telling, telling us that there are, there are particulates there that have what? Been aggregated. That has aggregated and will result in very low platelet counts. What do we know? The case demonstrates the importance of not excluding EDTA-induced thrombocytopenia in instances where patients present with low platelet counts. Platelet aggregation on the peripheral smear and no, with no physical findings or history suggest that, that, are, that is suggestive of thrombocytopenia. In cases where aminoglycosides are not readily available, the utilization of saturated tube and testing at 37 degrees Celsius could pro provide beneficial, ben could be beneficial in detecting this disorder with minimal um, aggregation for the saturated tube. Detection of EDT-induced thrombocytopenia is very important for physicians as well as laboratory personnel, as it averts unnecessary laboratory in investigations and superfluous interventions. I took this one step further, and I had a similar phenomenon, and I realized that the platelet counts for these patients increase incrementally after two to three hours. So what I did, the sample was collected, measurements was ex was, was ex were extremely low for the platelets, 
After three hours, I did another measurement, and I realized what? It gradually increased with time. A patient that has a true thrombocytopenic situation or presentation, will ne you'll never find that gradual increase in the, in the platelets with time. All right? And so that could be another useful marker to actually distinguish the platelet-induced thrombocytopenia from all other disorders of clinical significance. I thank you. I'll take your questions if you do have any. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mr. Pitkin, for that very informative. Oh, there's a question. Thank you for your very informative uh, presentation, Mr. Pitkin. Thank you. I have one uh, uncertainty here. Um, EDTA is known to bleed calcium from organic systems because it needs the calcium in order to work, if you're using calcium EDTA. Now, I never heard, maybe I wasn't listening, the dosage, and that depends on the dosage. Put a lot of e e EDTA, which is calcium deficient. It's gonna bleed calcium from the uh, body systems. That's the information that I have been exposed to recently. Not personally, but uh, in the literature. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, great. Thank you. So just to separate um, that question from the presentation, the presentation looks at what happens in the collection tube when the blood is collected. So it's an in vitro uh, phenomenon. But EDTA is a chelating agent. It binds calcium to form calcium salts, and in the, in the presence of blood, it prevents the clotting of blood. Once we EDTA is used in, within the system, it, it, the results are the same. The, however, as a race to the dosage, that depends on the, the, in, the, so the efficiency of chelating or removing calcium depends on the individual and, of course, the, the, the dosage as used. In vivo. Dosage uh, tailored to the individual. That's yes. what I'm seeing. Or in, in, uh, or in, 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 best, in best cases, do, should, we shouldn't be using um, EDTA, um, to, uh, in EDTA within, um, in vivo, that is. Yes. Thank Calcium you. is very important for multiple um, physiological functions. And as we get older, or the, the levels, depending on um, gender too, there, there are concerns for depleting levels of calcium. And of course, we would not want to have a, a significant remo reduction, reduction in our calcium levels for normal physiological function. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Is there another question? Oh, here's another. Um, good day, good day. Um, I'm not sure if I was too late to the whole symposium, but what do you think is the main cause that um, causes this to happen in the body? The rise of the, I forgot the name of it. Okay, the thrombocytopenia. So yes. the, the, okay, so what we know is that it's an immunological um, situation where the, the, so it does not occur in the body, it occurs in the tube. So some individuals, and we can't even say which individual, some individuals will react this way by producing an antibody to the, to, to, to the EDTA um, as, it, as it binds to the, 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 the 
the membrane of the platelets. All right? Uh, we say it's rare, and indeed it is. And we can't say who um, will react that way. We can't predict who will react that way. All our focus here is to be able to detect it early so that there's no um, major expense on unnecessary investigations for the patient. You're welcome, sir. All right, thank you very much, and thank you for those questions. And I want to encourage you, if you have questions, please write them down, and you know you'll get an opportunity at the end to um, um, present your questions. At this time, it is my distinct privilege um, to invite to the podium the president of Northern Caribbean University, um, Professor Lincoln Edwards, will be in, um, doing the introduction of our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Edwards. Good morning and welcome to Research Week right here at Northern Caribbean University. I'm delighted to see those of you who are here in the audience and I, I know some of you are from other institutions, and I extend a warm NCU welcome to all of you. Certainly want to welcome our students, our faculty, staff, and our administrators who are joining us for this very, very uh, important uh, research week. Let me pause to, to thank and to congratulate um, Tony Frankson, Dr. Uh, Martin Anthony Frankson, and his team for putting together this, this program that all of us can enjoy and learn additional things. So I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. delighted that you are here to, to participate in this ceremony. Uh, my substantive task, as was mentioned, is to introduce our guest speaker for this uh, morning's session. Dr. Penelope Dirksen Hughes received her PhD in biochemistry from Emory University in Atlanta in 1987. She worked in the laboratory of Dr. Keith Wilkinson, where she isolated and characterized one of the first known D. ubiquinitiles for her doctoral dissertation project. Following a postdoctoral fellowship, in the laboratory of Dr. Linda Gooding, where she focused on learning how adenoviruses evaded and disabled the host immune system. She spent two years at the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Dr. Hughes then accepted an appointment as an assistant professor at Georgia State University, where she was promoted to associate professor and received tenure in 2000. Dr. Dirksen Hughes then transitioned to Loma Linda University, where she set up a laboratory focused on understanding how the human papilloma virus evades the host immune system and causes cancer. Her current efforts are focused on finding better ways to prevent and treat this disease. One molecule identified in her lab has shown promise in an in vivo model, and Dr. Dirksen Hughes has created a small business with the goal of exploring the possibility of moving this molecule into clinical trials. More recently, Dr. Dirksen Hughes has become intrigued with the possibility that it may now be possible to understand the molecular basis of health and disease more clearly than ever before, and has partnered with other researchers in the schools of medicine and public health to define the genes, epigenetic patterns, and transcriptomic profiles that are associated with healthy longevity. In addition to her scientific work, Dr. Dirksen Hughes serves as the Associate Dean for Basic Science and Translational Research within the School of Medicine and as director of the Institute for Genetics and Translational Genomics. This 
short profile does not tell the full story of the work, the tremendous work that Dr. Hughes does. For example, our work in mentoring so many graduate students so that they now have a successful career. Her work in mentoring so many faculty at Loma Linda, and I, I was privileged to be there at the time when she, was, um, she, she became associate dean. And I know the interest that she has in developing faculty and moving all of us forward in our research career. Dr. Hughes accepted the, the invitation to join us at very short notice. And I want it to be known, Dr. Hughes, how thankful I am that you took time out of your very busy schedule, and I know how busy your schedule is, and to come here at Loma Linda, at NCU. Initially, she was going to do it online, and then we asked if she would consider coming in person, and she did not hesitate, and here she is today. And ladies and gentlemen, please help me make her feel welcome to Northern Caribbean University. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes, for accepting the invitation, and we look forward to your presentation. I believe we have uh, an item of music. The lovely ladies are here ready to go. Thank you, and it's now over to you.
right, let's see. So it's so good to see everyone, and I was especially delighted to see my, my good friend, uh, Dr. Edwards and uh, Jimenez, and you're my big surprise, Dr. McKenzie. So it's great to be here, and um, I'm honored for the invitation. What I'm here to tell you about today is some work that we've done with regarding trying to come up with a better therapy for some of these HPV-positive malignancies. Oh, there we go. So what I'll do is I'll um, give you the outline here. I'll start by showing you a little bit about the clinical need, um, how we selected a target, and then I'll give you some data. I'll give you data that's in vitro, kind of the in molecule part of it, then what it does in cells, and then finally what we have in animals. So starting with the clinical need, why we are focused on this particular disease, um, head and neck cancer. I guess there's, I'm sure there's a special way to do this. Okay, so this is the sixth most common cancer worldwide by incidence, and there's about 800,000 cases per year and about 350,000 deaths. So it's a fairly major thing. Um, squamous cell carcinoma um, it accounts for about 90% of these cancers. And if you take this and you can divide it up, um, some of it comes from HPV positive cancers and some of it from HPV negative cancers. So this gives you a little uh, figure as to the head and neck area and where some of these cancers sort of develop. Um, the two different types, as I indicated before, were either HPV positive or HPV negative. The HPV positive, I'm sorry, the HPV negative ones typically come about because of smoking um, and that sort of a thing, and it's kind of one bucket. The HPV positive ones are basically due to a specific virus, human papillomavirus, which tends to go into the consular areas and um, cause cancer in those areas. Now, the interesting thing is that when you look at management and outcomes, for the most part, what we have is equally used for both. And essentially, it's uh, radiation with or without some chemotherapy um, to go with it. The problem is, is that while you have quite good survival, it's like 80%, it's not personalized and it's not as specific as it should be. Because while that may be appropriate for some of the HPV negative tumors, these are the ones that show up later in life, like in the 50s and 60s, and um, the important thing there is for survival. But when you look at the HPV positive ones, it's really not the best therapy because these are men who are, it's mostly a disease of men, it, who are in their 20s and their 30s. They have many years of life because they're otherwise healthy. And when you do this kind of a treatment, you have a lot of damage. So a lot of them lose the salivary function, and so they have to go around for decades with a little spray bottle because they can't make their own saliva. So the goal is to see if we can't make life better for some of these men by coming up with a solution that's not as harmful, that is um, just as effective, if not better. So that's what the kind of driving force is. This is a table that just gives you about a sense of where the numbers come from. So really, when you think about it, HPV-positive tumors are about 5% of all cancers in the U.S. Um, and the biggest number is the like head and neck cancers. So that's the, tar the clinical need, and now we'll talk a little bit about the target itself. Okay, so essentially the HPV um, virus codes for two oncogenes, an E6 and an E7 oncogene. E7, for the most part, will um, interact with the cellular apparatus in a way that causes more division than would normally happen. So it kind of has its foot on the gas. For the HPV negative, I'm sorry, for E6, E6 works on the other side of it, and it makes it harder to kill these cells. So it kind of takes the brakes off. So you can see that if you have one protein, one virus protein making it go faster and one making it harder to stop, you can see how you set the stage for cancer. Um, there's a lot of different mechanisms by which this occurs. 
Um, but the sh I'll be focusing primarily on E6. For the project that we're working on, our goal has been ways to stop E6 from doing what it does best. <coughs> and what that means is keeping it from stopping cell death and the form of cell death we look at is apoptosis. So the short version of how this works is as follows. You've got um, a variety of ways in which East, um, you can activate apoptosis. Caspase 3 is involved, P53 is involved. And what E6 does is it binds to a protein that it binds to called E6AP. That then pulls in P53, puts ubiquitins on it, that takes the ubiquitins, takes it to the proteasome and has destruction of the P53 and these other apoptotic pathways. Another pathway that it works on is the um, endogenous apoptotic pathway where you have things like fat and caspase 8 and it basically does the same thing. It comes in, it binds to its targets and carts them off to the proteasome for degradation. And as it does that, you essentially sabotage the whole cell death pathway and it makes it very hard for the cell to be killed. Now that of course is a good idea for the virus because it likes to have little more cells making more viruses. But it's bad for the host because it means you can get cancer. So we're coming up with small drug-like molecules which will get in the way and get in between E6 and its partner proteins, salvage those um, apoptotic signaling molecules and make it easier for us to go ahead and kill those cells with radiation or whatever it is that we're choosing to use. So that's the basic idea, um, working model that small molecules that inhibit E6 activity can increase the effectiveness of all these different kinds of therapies for HPV positive head and neck cancer. All right, so now for some data. We started out by doing a big screen. And so what that basically says is we'll take a whole library of molecules of different types and we'll find a way to assay a lot of them at once and just kind of figure out which ones seem to do something and which ones don't. And then you have sequential filters where you keep making the list shorter and shorter until hopefully you end up with just one that you're testing. And so that's essentially what we did. The machine that we used is an alpha screen technology. This is what it looks like. And essentially what you're doing is you're taking two beads. And one bead you stick to one partner the E6, say, and the other bead you stick to the other partner, one of the cellular proteins. We use caspase 8. And then you ask whether or not these two cellular things, E6 and caspase 8, get close enough together. If they are close enough together, then you can hit, um, hit your solution with a particular radiation. It'll make singlet oxygen hop off. And if it is close enough to the next bead, it will then cause a different kind of emission. And you can detect that. So what you're looking for then is a loss of signal. And you'll get that loss of signal if you have the right small molecule that keeps these two partners from binding to each other. So we did that. Um, and this is a little bit of the data about the kind of uh, library we were using and the molecules that were in it. You end up looking at your results by a, a volcano plot. You can see why they call it that. But we were interested in that area on the upper right where it says hits. Those are areas where you got a lot of inhibition <coughs> with good um, reproducibility. And then, of course, we had to make the list shorter. And so one of the shorter things that we did to make it shorter was you said, does it stop the binding of things that don't really matter? And so as we did that, 
we discovered a few more things and we took them off the list. We are also able to ask whether or not it kept the binding of caspase 8 from caspase 8, and we weren't interested in anything that bound to caspase 8, so we took those off the list. And so this is just uh, showing you some of the graphs that we got from that analysis. And what we're looking for are um, candidates where those two curves are as separate as possible because that means that they're as effective as possible at keeping the desired binding from happening and they didn't do anything with the irrelevant binding. So once you have that list, now then you're asking if there are ways in which we can get rid of a few more. And it turns out that there actually are. There are a bunch of, I guess, use, things that you don't want to choose for a variety of reasons. Maybe they inhibit too many cellular pathways or something like that. So you kind of do this manually and you get rid of those. And we ended up with one, and that was cambogic acid. So then what you do is you take your candidate and you say, okay, how many of its relatives can I buy from anywhere? And maybe there's a relative that works even better. So we did that and we bought um, alternatives for each of these different um, functional groups and we tested them. And when we were done with that, there was just one that was the best and that was 30-hydroxycambogic acid. So that is our leak compound as of this point in time. There's the hydroxy. And so what I've told you thus far is that E6 is an appropriate target in the context of HPV-associated malignancies. That as small molecules that bind to E6 and inhibit its interactions with cellular partners were identified and ranked. There was one molecule that was selected for further analysis. And so now I'll be going through some of the data that we have in cells. And I won't be showing you all of the data, but I'll show you some selections. So the first thing we asked is, does it actually help kill cancer cells? And so we discovered that it does. It kills both cervical and head and neck cancer cells that are HPV positive. And this is just a couple of graphs that you can take a look at. And what you're looking for is where the um, curve shows the greatest amount of cell killing at the lowest dose. And so you can see that we were able to achieve that. You can also look at the individual molecules that are part of the apoptotic pathway, P53, for example, and some of the others. We did both Western blots and other assays as they were appropriate. And there's a way you, in which you can ask the question of whether you get synergy. So what synergy means is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So we know that things like cisplatin can kill cancer cells. We thought that our molecule could as well, but if you put them together, do you get something that's bigger than the two of them together? And there's a calculation for that, and that's called the Bliss model. And it turns out that it does. Um, we used, in this particular set of experiments, we were asking whether it synergized with seduximab, and it does. And you can see that purple bar is higher than the two smaller yellow and blue bars. We were also able to show that it can synergize with radiation. We were particularly interested in this part because we know that radiation is kind of the classical therapy, and so we saw this as being the most clinically relevant part. <coughs> and so you can see that we tried it with um, both HPV negative cells, and it really didn't synergize, but if you look at it with the HPV positive cells, you do see synergy. So we were absolutely delighted with that. You can also um, look to see whether apoptosis itself is uh, activated, and it turns out that it, it is. And the way you would look at that is you would look at the top row, which is HPV negative cells, and compare that with the bottom row, which is HPV positive cells. And so what you're looking for, if you're looking at the bar graph, would be the far right um, bar, and you can see that it does synergize. And if you look at a little bit more molecular basis, you can 
see the upregulation of these different um, proteins that are part of apoptosis that in the HPV positive rather than the HPV negative cells. So all of this is working as we had hoped. You can um, look a little bit more deeply and ask exactly why. Which proteins are we upregulating? And it turns out that, as you would predict, it's the molecules involved in the P53 pathway that are upregulated. Um, then you can ask, what's it doing to the cell cycle? And you are, in fact, affecting the cell cycle in the HPV-positive cells more than the HPV-negative cells. And so it's doing exactly what you would predict based on the, what we know about the pathways. So what I've told you so far, I already told you about the E6, it's an appropriate target, that the small molecules can bind to E6 and that we found one. Um, it t triggers death of these HPV-positive cells and it acts synergistically with partners such as radiation. So now what I'll tell you about is the um, animal studies. Um, I'll show you the toxicity data, a little bit of that, and then I'll also show you the efficacy data. So it took a while before we could figure out exactly what drug to try. We started out based on the literature and um, tried five mg per kilogram. But this seemed to be irritating. Um, this is the nude mouse model that we were using. Um, and you can see as these mice are kind of moving around, you can see that some of the places where we injected it, it looked painful. So we knew that we were going to have to reduce the dose. So we went down to three, and we still got something. And so we did a little bit more optimization and discovered that if you have two, you get mild toxicity. And finally, at 0.25, it's non-toxic. And uh, you c could work probably within a range of 0.5 to 1 kilogram, mg per kilogram, and we chose to work with 0.6. This gives you also the doses that we use for cisplatin and cetuximab, which is one of the other treatments we wanted to see if we could get synergy with. So this was our study design. Um, we had molecules that were hum derived from human head and neck tumors, and we had um, given them a, a plasmid that would allow us to see the tumor as it grew on a, um, on a machine that detects kind of fluorescence. You can also measure the tumors the old-fashioned way with a caliper, so we did both. So we grew these tumors in mice. So these are human tumors growing in mice, these nude mice. Um, some of them just treated with the vehicle. Some of them got GAOH. Some of them got cetuximab. Some of them got cisplatin. And then some of them got the combination of GAOH with either cetuximab or cisplatin. Um, this was our timeline. We um, gave the tumors a chance to grow and establish, and then we started treating. Uh, we would give the GOH, we would give the cisplatin or cetuximab, we'd give the mice a chance to rest, we'd repeat that. And then finally, um, we would image at specific points, and then we finally um, would sacrifice. So giving you kind of the um, clinical observations for the uh, toxicity, we measured their level of activity, behavior, posture, eyes, temperature, weight loss, and it looked pretty pretty safe. This is the weight. Um, there was no weight loss, so that looked pretty good. Um, we did a variety of toxicity uh, measurements. The behavioral body weight I showed you, gross necropsy, um, the kidney and liver and spleen weights all seemed perfectly fine. Um, hematology, for the most part, that was good. There were a couple things that we'll pay attention to in the blood chemistry. But now I'll move on to the tumor growth, and this is the exciting part. So what we were doing was we were measuring the tumor growth over time to see whether or not it made a difference. And you can see that the, the control, the, um, nothing was done to the tumor. You can see how it grew over time.
What I want to draw your attention to is that dotted line. That dotted line that's um, probably kind of in the middle of the graph, that's our compound plus cisplatin. If you only give the mice cisplatin, you have to go up to the line above that, and so you can see that adding GAOH made a difference. You can also see that cetuximab was really, really effective with or without our compound, so you really couldn't see whether our compound mattered or not. Um, the graph to the right is the same data, but it's shown um, with the actual data points as opposed to the statistically um, analyzed and, and massaged way. This is another way of looking at exactly the same data where we look at tumor sizes before and after treatment, and you can see that uh, cisplatin matters, and then once you add GA to cisplatin, you get an even greater effect. So we were delighted with that. These are just some of the same data again, but it's comparing the um, different groups. Um, the one that's probably of the most interest would be on the far right where we're looking at cisplatin versus cisplatin plus GAOH. So the conclusion so far, um, the new ones, is that the GAOH displays a favorable toxicity profile and that it synergizes with cisplatin to slow tumor growth in vitro. And I just want to kind of give you a sense for how long this process takes. <laughs> so you basically start with a process um, of trying to figure out what you should target to discover it and validate it. Uh, then you have to come up with an assay. You have to come up with your hits. You have to sort these hits out. You have to get rid of some of them. You choose a lead. You optimize it and you test it and you kind of keep going back and forth. And so these are some of my students who I've had working on the project over these years. Uh, Sandy made some of the original observations for choosing the target. Then we have uh, Sean, um, who found one of the first compounds that was of interest. Lennox um, Chitsky, um, he's an MD-PhD student in my lab from Zimbabwe. He made the um, GAOH connection. Uh, Masha was, she's from Novosibirsk in, in Russia, and she helped uh, run the whole project. And then most recently, Sonia has done the animal work. I just love the international nature of these scientific collaborations. So I want to acknowledge all the members of my lab. Um, I want to acknowledge the NIH for providing funding. And, and I want to thank you for listening. So I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. I had two questions. First, I'm trying to recall if you had mentioned the particular the, the strain of HPV. And secondly, I remember you, you're saying that the toxicity studies for the liver, the kidney, they were okay. But which of these systems, um, the liver, the kidney, were, were most affected um, by the, the therapy? So the, um, the type that we were analyzing against was HPV-16. And you were asking, your second question was, how did we deliver the drug into the tumor? No, no. Uh, in assessing toxicity, you'd have looked at the impact on the liver and the kidney, kidneys. Uh, which of these systems were, were mostly impacted? You said that they were okay, but... Um... Yeah. Uh, there was one mouse in the entire study section who um, developed splenomegaly. And uh, so we had a big spleen, and we're not sure why, but that really was the only abnormality we did. Everything else was within normal. Thank you. Good day, ma'am. Um, I would like to know, I'm not a science student myself, but I am a bit curious. Is it possible for the body to build up tolerance against E6 and cis planting is it possible for the body to develop a tolerance for e6 and cisplatin yes. cisplatin is a toxicity drug um, it's cancer it's kind of general purpose and most 
Most people do suffer fairly severe side effects to it. I don't know of, that there's any um, tolerance that you build up. With E6, um, small amounts, uh, it's not a big deal. It's when you have too much to, to, for the balance between pro and anti-apoptotic, which is what you get when you get integration of HPV. All right, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, well, or it's still morning. Um, we are going to be having our next presenter at this time. It's Dr. Alexia Zimenez. She's a member of faculty here at Northern Caribbean University, and she'll be coming at this time to address us on some aspects. Yes. Oh, there's a presentation. All right, so Dr. Hughes, we thank you for that relevant information because what this at the time see now, they are saying that in another decade, at least not only one in two persons in the U.S. will have cancer, but they are saying that in, this, in the next decades to come, they might find that at least every individual will have some kind of cancer in their lifetime. That's what they are predicting. So very relevant information. And... Uh, so we look forward to the research that is yielding results and the results being yielded. At this time, I'll ask Ms. Alicia Baldwin to present Dr. Hughes with a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Come. All right, that is right. Yes. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, and esteemed guests, this is with sincere gratitude that I extend my heartfelt um, thank you to our keynote speaker for today. Your wisdom, insight, and passion has truly impacted us all. And as a token of our appreciation, please accept this slice of Jamaica as a symbol of our immense gratitude for sharing your expertise with us today. Okay, um, let's give another round of applause. That was an excellent presentation, and we are so thankful for Dr. Hughes to come all this way to present to us. We are so grateful. At this time, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Alexia Zimenez, who will be talking to us on some molecular aspect of biochemistry. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, while I wait for my slides to um, come up, oh, there they are. Um, I want to thank again Dr. Hughes for being here. She's actually um, one of my professors. She taught me immunology when I was in graduate school, so it's really good to see her again. Uh, this morning I'll be sharing with you some uh, data that I had uh, in my, um, for my dissertation. Um, when I was doing my graduate work, uh, where we were able to discover a novel enzyme. Uh, so our topic for our talk today is discovering a novel diagonalate cyclase using bioinformatics to ask the right questions. Okay, so for our outline, we will be having just a brief introduction. Uh, we will be looking at our aims, uh, aim one, uh, looking at genetic studies, and aim two, protein functional assays, and an overall summary and conclusion, and then our acknowledgments. So we were investigating Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is a gram-negative anaerobe that colonizes the um, oral cavity. Uh, here we have, uh, let me see, here, 
uh, we have forward, okay, we have the healthy periodontium where we have um, the gingiva, the periodontal ligament, cementum, and alveolar bone. Uh, this is what it looks like in the healthy situation. We have our early colonizers uh, and then our late colonizers that are more pathogenic. So Porphyromonas gingivalis uh, is a keystone pathogen in that it shifts the microbiota that we find in our oral cavity from that commensal uh, microbiome to a more pathogenic microbiome. So once we have colonization with Porphyrimonas gingivalis, what happens is that the more pathogenic microbes start to colonize your oral cavity. So in the healthy periodontium, you're not going to see a lot of um, Porphyromonas gingivalis. Uh, going forward, I'll be just calling it PG or P gingivalis. So uh, in our healthy oral cavity, we don't see much of that. But as uh, we um, progress in a diseased state, we'll see increased, we will see increased populations of P gingivalis. Now this is the healthy teeth where we see the gums are attached, they're pink and they're stippled and so they're healthy. Um, when we have periodontal disease, uh, we may start from inflamed gums, which is the gingivitis, but as that progresses, we can get to severe periodontitis, or um, what happens is that we have the loss of alveolar bone. So our gums recede and the bone gets dissolved. And uh, as it progresses, that periodontal pocket becomes deeper and deeper. In the healthy periodontal po pocket, when you probe it, it's gonna be less than one millimeter with that probe. But as the disease progresses and we lose that bone and we lose that gum structures, we're gonna see we're going to see um, the deepening of that periodontal pocket. Now, when we have this severe periodontitis, um, it's um, often irreversible. Um, so we can treat the condition, but the gum that's lost is lost. But um, we do have some treatment strategies where we can have skin grafts um, and bone grafts like that. But it is, um, when we get to the stage of severe periodontitis, we do have... Uh, um, difficulty in treating this disease. Okay. Now, why do we care about periodontitis? You know, it's just the disease of the mouth. But it's very important for us to address this disease. Periodontal disease Periodontal diseases, they affect more than half of the global population. So um, for those of us who are in here now, um, about half of us have periodontal disease, even if it is just gingivitis, yes? Um, about 11% of the world suffers from severe periodontitis where we have the loss of the gum, the loss of that alveolar bone, and it is the sixth most prevalent disease in the world. No, it becomes important because periodontal disease is linked to several other conditions, um, notably cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancers. And recently when we had our um, COVID pandemic, it was noticed that those who had severe COVID symptoms also had severe um, periodontitis or severe periodontal symptoms as well. Um, the relationship between them have, has not been established. There still needs to be more research. But with um, another disease, diabetes, there is a reciprocal um, relationship where as diabetes gets worse, your um, periodontitis gets worse. And as the periodontitis gets worse, it exacerbates your diabetes. So they, are, they have this reciprocal relationship. In terms of COVID, we're not sure um, if that reciprocal relationship is there. We're still looking at it. So it's important for us to have good oral health and um, that because what's happening in your mouth will reflect what's happening in your body and can exacerbate any other diseases that you may have. 
Okay, so we want to look at the mechanisms by which uh, PG or P. gingivalis survives in the oral cavity. And in our lab, we look at oxidative stress resistance in um, this organism. So we realized that under several different conditions, this gene, PG0686, is upregulated um, on when the P. gingivalis is exposed to human epithelial cells, um, when it's exposed to nitric oxide, when it's exposed to oxygen and hydrogen peroxide, we can see that there is an increase in the fold change of this gene. So we uh, postulated that this gene is important in oxidative stress resistance. If the organism is making it when it's under stress, then it should be uh, functioning in some way in oxidative stress resistance in this organism. And so we had two aims. Um, one was to um, see what removing that gene uh, will do to the organism. So we looked at the effect of PG0686 mutagenesis on oxidative stress resistance in P. gingivalis will be. And also we wanted to determine the function of this PG0686 protein um, in Porphyrimonas gingivalis. Okay, so like we said, previous studies had shown that this gene is upregulated under oxidative stress. So the first thing we did was to confirm those results. And using RT-PCR and real-time PCR, what we found was that there was an upregulation when the organism was treated with hydrogen peroxide, oxygen, and nitric oxide. Now, I don't remember if I stated this, it is a gram-negative anaerobe, so um, after two hours in air, in oxygen, it dies. Um, but exposing the organism for about one hour in air, we, it doesn't die, but we do see an upregulation of this gene. Yes, so um, these are our results where we see an upregulation in the production of PG0686. Our next step was to remove the gene and observe um, what would happen to the organism um, during this mutagenesis. So we replaced the gene itself with an erythromycin cassette, which would render the mutant uh, resistant to erythromycin. After we created this mutant, we stressed both the wild type, which is W83, and the mutant with different forms of oxidative stress. In this diagram, we're showing um, a time course. So we looked at the growth over a um, 24-hour period of the cultures. And we saw that the mutant that was stressed grew significantly slower than the wild type that was stressed um, with hydrogen peroxide. Now, um, the graph is showing, or see, the time course is showing um, the growth over 24 hours, but we also plated these samples to look at the viability of the cultures. And we saw that um, we had a reduction in viability when the mutant was stressed compared to the uh, wild type. Um, the survival was reduced in the wild type as well, but significantly more so in the mutant. Uh, we also tried to reintroduce the gene um, into the mutant through complementation to see if we could restore um, the wild type phenotype, however, um, we introduced a gene on a plasmid and um, it did not restore the wild type phenotype. So we believe that it must be on the chromosome and not on a plasmid in order to restore the phenotype. 
We also looked at um, stress studies using air or oxygen and nitric oxide, and we did see that there was a retardation in the growth of the mutant compared to the wild type. Um, so these studies are showing that um, the gene 0686 um, is uh, functioning in some way in oxidative stress resistance in P. gingivalis. Next, we looked at transcriptome analysis where we isolated the total mRNA from both of the strains, and then we compared which genes were differentially expressed. We looked at the genes that were upregulated, and we looked at the genes that were downregulated. Um, and this is a volcano plot, or these are volcano plots of the upregulated and downregulated genes when we looked at transcriptome analysis. Um, of note is uh, um, the ginger panes that um, are essential for the organism's survival. And what these ginger panes do, they will break down protein so that the organism can survive. So the organism is asacrylytic, so it doesn't use um, sugars as its primary fuel source, but proteins. And this is one of the reasons that the inflamed periodontal pocket is such a um, great environment for P. gingivalis because the immune response will cause inflammation and that exacerbates the breakdown of the gums, the breakdown of the proteins that we find in our mouths and, and P. gingivalis thrives in those conditions. So um, in terms of our genetic studies, we found that removing the gene um, resulted in um, sensitivity to oxidative stress. So the PG0686 mutagenesis impeded the ability of P. gingivalis to respond to oxidative stress, indicating that this gene functions in oxidative stress resistance in some way. Now that we confirmed some of the data that we had seen before, and we did our um, reactive oxygen species sensitivity study, we wanted a direction. We, this was a hypothetical protein, and we didn't know anything about it at all. Okay? It had all the markers that a protein would be expressed, um, but it was never expressed before, and we had no idea what the function would be. Uh, so we were going ahead doing the genetic studies, but in terms of the protein studies, where do we go from there? And this is where bioinformatics um, analyses were very important, where we use computer technology to analyze biological data. So we were able to get the protein sequence um, from NC NCBI um, database, and then we were able to do a BLAST analysis, that's a basic local alignment um, analysis, um, to compare the sequence of the protein with other proteins um, that were in the database. And what we found um, was, you know, when you do these BLAST analyses, you get over 500, over 1,000 sometimes results. And so we had to comb through that. And we were able to um, select just a few proteins to make this phylogenetic tree where we're, we were able to look at the similarities between these proteins. Now, when I first looked at the results, I saw a lot of different proteins that I didn't know, and I saw several diguanolate cyclases in the phylogenetic tree, and I said, diguanolate cyclase, what is that? And so that's where we started to research what these diguanolate cyclases could do. And so we found that this uh, PG0686 was related um, to these diguanolates cyclases, and there have been some diguanolate cyclases that were previously studied. And not just previously studied, extensively studied. Um, so those are the diguanolate cyclases identified in the phylogenetic tree. Now we're able also to send the protein sequence to ITASA, um, which is an online database where you can send in the protein 
you can send in the protein sequence and they do a model of the protein for you. And then they send it back to you after, um, it used to be two days, but now that it's heavily trafficked, it's about a week or two weeks now um, to get back your results. And what, what we found was that there were three major domains in this protein. We had, the blue domain is the hemerythrin domain, the pink domain is the past domain, and then we had a domain of unknown function um, present in the protein. Um, so that's the model of the protein and also the sequence, the protein sequence with the different domains highlighted. So this is a model that we received um, when we sent in our protein sequence to be modeled. And um, we are seeing in the blue, again, um, we have four alpha helices that form this hemerythrin domain. And then we have in pink those beta sheets that are forming the past domain. Um, we're able also to use Swiss model. So um, Swiss model is a database online that you can plug in your um, amino acid sequence and it will um, compare it to other sequences that are there. And um, the second model that has two of these structures, um, Swiss model was predicting that it was a dimeric protein. So we had two subunits. Um, in that structure, which is interesting because most of the diguanolate cyclases that have been previously described and studied are multimeric. So we were excited about that, that um, we were getting a multimeric protein from the modeling. And the two bottom structures are showing the potential binding sites um, for the hemerythrin domain and for the past domain. In the hemerythrin domain, which is the blue um, structure, um, there is predicted to be an iron center where oxygen can bind. And on the pink, there's predicted to be a phosphate binding um, pocket um, where any phosphates can bind. That was also exciting because diguanolate cyclases, what they do is they convert GTP to a cyclic di-GMP. So the um, uh, prediction of the phosphate binding site was also very exciting for us. So with the modeling now, we wanted to compare our model, our protein model, to other diguanolate cyclases that were previously um, studied. And when we did that, however, we did not get a good score. We did not get a good alignment with the previously studied diguanolate cyclases. So that was a bit discouraging because we were expecting that they would have similar structures since we were um, postulating that our protein was a diguanolate cyclase. However, we did find some other diguanolate cyclases. They were labeled diguanolate cyclases, um, but they did not have the features of a diguanolate cyclase, which we will we'll get into um, a little further. However, the alignment with our protein um, was very high, so they were very similar in structure. So what we had now was um, Previously studied diguanolate cyclases, the active site was previously identified and they knew what those active site sequences were. And those were not lining up at all with our protein. Um, this is um, an alignment between PG0686 protein and the studied diguanolate cyclases. And as you can see with the alignments, um, we are not seeing a lot of um, similarities between the sequences. Uh, we use uh, Clustal Omega for this alignment. So that's another bioinformatic tool that you can use online where you put in the sequences for the proteins that you want to compare and an alignment is done to see if there are similar um, sequences in the structures. And what we found was that when we aligned our protein to the previously studied diguanolate cycle we did not see the complementarity or we did not see the structural similarities that we were expecting. Um, on the right, we have 
the diagonalate cyclases themselves being aligned with each other. And so what you can see is that um, we have the blues and the cyan colors. So those are showing the areas that are similar in these, um, in these proteins. And off note is a motif that is GGDEF that's found in all of them. GGDEF or GGEEF that's found in all of these proteins when you align them. Um, it's one of those dark um, blue areas that we see in the alignment. However, our protein did not have this GGDEF or EEF motif at all. So now we are wondering, okay, is it really a diagonalate cyclase? We were not sure. However, we did find some other digonalate cyclases or proteins that were annotated as digonalate cyclases but did not have this GGDEF motif. And this is the alignment between these annotated digonalate cyclases. So you can see that there are many areas of similarities between our proteins and these, our protein and these proteins. Okay, so the digonalate cyclases has this GGDEF domain, and this is a catalytic domain. This is where the conversion from GTP to cyclic DIGMP occurs. And um, this cyclic DIGMP uh, is a second messenger web that we can find in many species of bacteria. And so this is the equation where we have the conversion of our GTP to di cyclic DIGMP. Now the question was, does our protein catalyze this reaction? And if it does, um, where's the catalytic site? Because like I said, our protein does, did not have this GGDEF motif. Now, um, we were able to overexpress the protein, and uh, um, we used mass spec to confirm the recombinant protein that we overexpressed. Okay. If our protein was a digonalate cyclase, we expect that um, we will get two products. We get the cyclic DIGMP, um, and we will get pyrophosphate. Okay, so what we plan to do and what we did do was assay for both of these products. We wanted to do an assay to find out if pyrophosphate was um, um, present. And we have a, there are a lot of pyrophosphate or phosphate kits out there. Um, so you can just get a kit and do that. The challenge was in detecting the cyclic DIGMP. Um, which would indicate to us that our protein um, was a diagonalate cyclase. Okay. Um, so we also tested the mutant um, to see if there was um, reduced cyclic IGMP in the mutant, and we did find that. We also um, did some assays where we looked at the production of this pyrophosphate. Oh, sorry. Yes, so we also used a known digonalate cyclase, which is PLED, that does have the um, canonical GGDEF motif um, as our positive control, just to see that our experiment was working. And what we found was that um, in the samples with the known digonalate cyclase, the PLED, we did see an increased production of pyrophosphate. And excitingly, when we um, looked at our sample with the PG0686, we also saw production of the pyrophosphate. Now, the next part was to detect the cyclic DIGMP uh, product, and so we use um, mass spec um, analysis to determine that. And, um, it, these results are showing that um, in our sample with our PG0686 protein, we saw cyclic DIGMP production. So we're very excited about that. So we have our commercially obtained cyclic DIGMP as a control. And we also had the sample with the known digonalic cyclase PLED as a positive control. And the top three um, 
the top three figures are showing the presence of the cyclic DIGMP in those samples. In the bottom figures, we're seeing our negative controls not having the cyclic DIGMP. So we're very excited about the results uh, because we were able to show that PG0686 does have diguanylate cyclase activity, even though it does not have the GGDEF catalytic site um, canonical motif that previously described um, diguanylate cyclases have. So uh, we were able to discover a new class of diguanylate cyclase um, because it is doing the same job that the diguanylate cyclases previously described um, are doing. However, um, it does not have the active site that's there. So no, the next step would be to identify that active site in our protein. Okay, um, so in conclusion, um, we were able to show that our protein is a multimeric protein, that it has um, diguanylate cyclase activity. Um, I did not show some of the results here, but we also showed that iron was present in the protein as predicted by our bioinformatics analysis. And uh, we are very excited to know that we were able to identify a new class of diguanylate cyclases, the first of its kind to be identified. Okay, um, that's it for my talk. I want to um, acknowledge um, those who have helped me, those that were in my lab. Special thanks to my professors from Loma Linda um, University, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimenez, for that very enlightening presentation. Um, you know, this morning session was heavily molecular in terms of molecular biology, and um, I know some of you might be more interested in computer science and microbiology. The afternoon session, which will be coming up later on, so stick around. Um, after lunch, we'll be having some other discussions in those areas. Um, so, at this time, we'll be entertaining any questions for Dr. Zimenez at this time. Any questions? Okay, I think. Question? Or oh, there's a question at the, the fire. Good morning, Dr. Zeminis, for an excellent presentation. I was listening very keenly to you. I realized some of the analysis were done somewhere. Is it that it was done free of cost or there was a cost attached to those analyses? Um, are you referring to the bioinformatics analyses? The protein. Um, for the protein modeling? Yes. Um, those those are resources are free online. So you can go online, um, the databases are online, so you can just access them and put in the protein sequence and um, depending on which one it is, you can get it back um, okay. quickly. So like I said, for ITESA, there's a little bit of wait, so maybe a week to two weeks to get back your model. Swiss model, the um, return is pretty much instantaneous. I would say at most five minutes. So okay. you'll see processing. So five there minutes. was none that was paid for? Um, no, none of the modeling, no. Um, the, um, 
That's okay. I was just trying. I was just right. No, you, um, these no these resources are free online. Okay. Um, even with the Cluster Omega, you can do it online, or you can even download the program for free, okay. and then do it on your own computer. Um, so there are different modeling software that you can get for free. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your question, Prof. Well done, Dr. Zemis. Thank you, Dr. Frankson. I didn't understand half of what you said, but <clears throat> I wasn't alone. <laughs> um, it just shows the beauty of specializing. Science is such a vast thing. So I want to ask you if you could spend a few minutes um, just explaining to our young audience mm -hmm. what are the prerequisites for getting the kind of education? What do you need to have to get finally to what you have here? What are the subjects that they could be concentrating in so that they could end up just oh. like you, maybe? One might be better than you, but most not as good um, as you. All my students will do better than I have, yes? That's right. Um, well, um, in terms of the route that I took, I um, did biochemistry in my undergraduate. Um, for my master's, I did the molecular biology route, and then I did microbiology um, at the PhD level. Um, so uh, I would suggest biochemistry, uh, which is a wonderful subject, which will allow you to excel in whatever field you may um, pursue in the future. <laughs> Uh, biochemistry is a good uh, subject to do. Organic chemistry helps really well with biochemistry. If you have a very firm foundation in organic chemistry, you will do well in, I think you will do well in biochemistry. So for those of you who are running away from organic chemistry, I'm gonna encourage you not to do that. Um, another thing I would, um, encourage um, is not to be afraid to try different things. Um, when we were doing protein modeling, I had to learn how to do that. Um, of course, I was not at the level where I could code because um, the really professional um, modeling um, specialists, they write these software, like they code it themselves, okay? I was not able to do that. However, I did find these resources online and I had to pretty much teach myself how to use them. Um, so do not shy away from um, these things that may appear difficult at the beginning. Um, in terms of the volcano plots that we, what that I showed you, I actually did that, those myself in Excel. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, it's not difficult, it's more labor intensive. So this is what I would suggest to you, that yes, you're gonna have your foundational courses in biochemistry and organic chemistry um, and some molecular biology as well. However, when, whenever you have a task to do, even though it's daunting, I would suggest that um, you just say, you know what, I'm gonna try to do this or at least find someone to help me um, do um, this daunting task even though I'm afraid or even though I don't know what's going on. Um, when I just started with the modeling, I had no idea, no clue. When I saw the volcano plots, I was, I was like, I don't think I'm gonna have this diagram, I'm just gonna forget about it. And then something said, why don't you try doing it in Excel? And I tried it and I got it done. So that's what I would suggest to my students. Um, there's a question. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. You, you mentioned the relationship between periodontal disease and diabetes, yes. and given the high prevalence of diabetes in Jamaica, what advice would you give to persons regarding their oral health care? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Um, 
not just diabetes, but we're going to address the question of diabetes, but other um, systemic diseases as well. What we want to do is uh, cut down on our sweets. I know some of my students know I do have a sweet tooth, and so um, it's difficult, but you have to be judicious. What will you eat? What will you not eat? And um, what you can do is... Uh, ensure that you are brushing very regularly. So if you have a high sugar meal, you can just go ahead and brush af directly after. That's important. Um, and we want to go to the dentist as often as we can. Uh, most insurance policies will have dental care on there, right? Um, so it may seem like a trivial thing, but it's important for us to um, be aware of our oral health. Sometimes if I get a, an ache, I can pick it up early and say, oh, something is going on right here, and then I become a little bit more vigilant with my oral care. Even though we should be vigilant at all times, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. And instead of brushing two times, I will brush three times. Um, and sometimes I'll use salt um, to gargle and like that. Um, so uh, paying attention to your oral health, that's important. And the tips that I could give you, um, go to the dentist as often as you can, um, brush as often as you can, and uh, just pay attention to what's happening in your mouth. Because sometimes it just starts out with a little pain, and the next thing you know, there's this big infection in your mouth. Um, but if you catch it early, then you're able to um, kind of um, put off that large infection. And that's important because the oral pathogens can get into your bloodstream through um, these wounds in your mouth. Uh, there have been um, isolation of um, P. gingivalis from, um, from atherosclerotic plaques, right? So plaques that are in your arteries, they have isolated this oral pathogen from those plaques. So we know that these wounds can give access to these pathogens. So we want to be vigilant that we notice what's going on and then even in the early stages, see if we can prevent it from getting worse. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Uh, just a question, uh, uh, just a comment actually, um, just in case we think we should only go to the dentist, please remember to go to the dental hygienist who we definitely have on this campus okay. and who has been well solicited in by some, some quarters, etc. I just wanted to comment on one little bit of statistics. Um, when you said about half of us in this room have periodontal disease. I just want to challenge you on that. It might be because, higher. Because it might be um, actually lower because of the youthfulness of the group. Okay. Because um, half was an overall statistic, which mm -hmm. means there might be a concentrated group that had maybe 40, 75%, but when you average it out for everybody, it becomes a half. So cheer up everybody, half of you might not have periodontal <laughs> disease. However, please go to the dental hygienist to make sure that you're not the one who has it. Uh, uh, thank you for that point, Dr. Franks, and that's um, a good observation. One of the risk factors for advanced periodontal disease is age. So you will find that the older persons will have um, the advanced periodontal disease, severe periodontal disease, but I was including um, gingivitis in there, which is um, just an inflammation of the gums um, and bleeding upon probing. Um, I don't know if some of you notice that if you're brushing, you might see some bleeding happening. Um, so that might be a mild case of periodontal disease. Uh, so, but our talk was primarily aimed at severe periodontal disease where we're losing our gums, our alveolar bone, or even some of our teeth. Um, so like Dr. Frankson said, fear not. 
uh, you may not have advanced periodontal disease, but we are going to encourage you to pay attention to your oral health because it will help you with your overall health. Thank you. Okay, well done. I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for, for that input, and um, I'm sure a lot of the young persons here would have learned um, something about a scientific career. You know, a lot of what person, people do in medicine, um, what doctors get, uh, the, 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 the diagnosis that doctors make, um, a lot of that, those diagnoses actually come from um, research that has been done at the molecular level. And so a lot of what Dr. Ziminis was talking about, you know, some of it may have gone over our heads, but a lot of it is, is, is a groundwork for many of those breakthrough um, findings that we hear in the medical area. And so we, we thank you for that, that, that um, presentation. Um, and at this time, there is, um, on the schedule, it says announcements. I know there's a, there's a geological museum at the back with Dr. Miller. Um, so during the, the intermission, I guess, if you are interested, you could go there and look at some, some, some of the specimens that he has there as a, a, a diverse collection of rocks um, um, at the back, and you can go there and look at those. There's also some posters that are um, put up on the side. I'm not seeing many, but there are a few. Um, and at this time, we're going to be having a Oh, there are some at that side. Um, yeah, during the intermission, we can all have a look at those. And at this time, we're going to be having a, a book launch um, for Professor Harris. So I'm going to be inviting the persons who are involved in that to come forward at this moment. Persons for the book launch. We're always happy to have these events at NCU. Uh, Professor ha Harris at a previous book launch, and then Professor Errol Miller, uh, Professor Emeritus from the University of the West Indies, also had a book launch here that was held in the chapel uh, about maybe a month ago or so, uh, where he's had two volumes that he presented on the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, during the colonial era. And that was very, very interesting because we found out that for many of the black males who had no opportunities during the colonial era, it was the Seventh-day Adventist Church and particularly the Northern Caribbean University that was able to assist due to the fact that we had the work-study program here where persons with no resource could come here and they could work in the mornings and then go to classes in the afternoon and, and had a career because of that. So Northern Caribbean University continues 
to celebrate the achievements in the field of research by Professor Mark Harris from the Department of Biology, Chemistry, and Environmental Science in the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health, and Nursing. Professor Harris was awarded the Musgrave Silver Medal for Science by the Council of the Institute of Jamaica for 2020 to 2021. He is the recipient of the NCU Distinguished Faculty Award in 2016, 2012, 2007, and 2003. He is a consummate researcher with an extensive body of work, and I'll highlight some of those. Uh, he is the world record holder jointly with CK Komsun for cyanide removal, 87% removal from grated bitter cassava, which paralyzes thousands of children in sub-Saharan Africa using moisture pressure treatments. And that work was published in the Journal of Food Science some years ago. He has also been instrumental in the long-life treated bamboo yam stick to reduce tropical deforestation using cold water in situ dissolution of bamboo starch by alcoholic alkali in an anaerobic bioreactor. And that work was published in the International Journal of Environmental Science and Technology. He has also come up with a method for reducing the world's wind-blown bauxite red mud mine dust. Dust reduction in bauxite red mud waste using carbonation, gypsum, and flocculation. And again, that was published in Environmental Earth Sciences. He has also uh, produced a humidifier which increases root initiation and germination of sweet potato cuttings in dry soils because drying climates can destroy cuttings before planting and after planting. And that work was published in the Journal of Agricultural Science. Professor Harris has written uh, several peer-reviewed uh, publications and has authored several books. In 2016, he wrote Geobiotechnological Solutions to Anthropogenic Disturbances, a Caribbean Perspectives. In 2019, he wrote Confronting Global Climate Change, Experiments and Applications in the Tropics. And his latest book, which we are here to launch, is The Science of Global Warming Remediation, right here, which addresses the critical issue of climate change. And he, Professor Harris, will tell you more about um, the book. So on behalf of the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health and Nursing, as well as the wider university family, I extend congratulations and highest commendation to Professor Harris for continuing to be the institution's ambassador in the field of research and scientific inventions. His success is a demonstration of the inventive and innovative culture that pervades NCU. Here, we build character, creativity, and competence. And so Professor Harris will talk about the book. And when you hear about the book, uh, my advice and encouragement to you is to buy the book and to read the book so that the work that has gone into producing the, this book will, will certainly not go to waste, but that we will gain the knowledge that Professor Harris has worked so hard to ensure that is made available. So a round of applause for Professor Harris. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Edwards, for that uh, introduction. Um, so, uh, um, 
I have to say, however, that um, many people don't know this, but that silver medal that I won in 2019-2020, it would not have been received, it would not have been won without Professor Edwards. And I'm sure he doesn't know what I'm going to say now. But he is the one who alerted CCMPR Mr. Buckley to advise me to apply for that award. I put the uh, application together and promptly forgot about it. When I was telephoned, I almost didn't know what they were talking about. So my thanks to our president for that. I was also told by Mr. Buckley that I shouldn't talk for half an hour. I was not very happy that he said that because everybody here in, at, at NCU knows me as a brief speaker. All right? <laughs> All right. Um, let me just say, however, that uh, the reason we are for the writing of this book, I considered two reviews of the 2019 book, Confronting Global Climate Change, Experiments and Applications in the Tropics. The two reviews came from, one came from Professor Larry Erickson, uh, Professor Emeritus for Chemistry at Kansas State University. His review came and I read it. Also a review from Christopher Sergio of the Daily Glean of Jamaica. It was striking that they both said the, just about word for word the same things, and they did not know each other. So I said, if two people who are professionals in their field say something to you, you should listen, especially if they had no contact with each other. And what uh, each person said is that there was one chapter in that book I think it's Appendix 3, which addressed every chapter with a problem and solution. And they highlighted that very uh, starkly, yes. And therefore, I said to myself, if I'm going to do another book again, if I'm going to do another book, it has to be one based on that. Now, um, so I proceeded to write this one. Um, and, uh, you know, I must say one more thing too. I like the book. I'm not talking about money. It has no connection with me as far as the book is concerned, right? Um, if I take it, if, if, if I get it, I'll take it, but you know, I don't really care. And, um, but, uh, as I was saying, um, it's said you shouldn't wash your dirty linen in public, but I don't think this linen is very dirty, so I'll wash it anyway. Uh, some time ago in Australia, I had to teach a high school class uh, in physics, equivalent of about O-level physics, you know? And I, the textbook is the greatest physics book, at least at that level that I'd ever seen. But you know what? That physics book had several mistakes in it. There's nothing that's perfect, okay? And I dare say there's no book that's perfect. But this book that I'm talking about today has over 300 problems and solutions in it. But having read it over, after I got the hard copy back, after doing so many revisions of the book, could you believe that I found some mistakes in it? I found about, of the 300 problems, there are about uh, four which have mistakes. All right? And some people may say small mistakes, but they are mistakes anyway. Four out of 300. Uh, I'm not happy with that, but uh, I tried. <laughs> okay? So if anybody buys the book, I have the corrections. 
and I can send the corrections to them for those few uh, problems. Okay. Um, the next thing I'd like to say um, is to go to just some highlights of this work. And I'd like to... Right? That's it. Uh, we, we, we just do a look inside. Book, this book attempts to isolate phenomena in the climate change affected environment which are responsive to anthropogenic oh this one okay I've never had this one before, so I'm looking at you and speaking on that, right? Not on my computer. Is that what you're saying? Okay, but it's not working. I'm pressing the button you said I should press, but it's not working. I'm not seeing anything. What's going on? Could we, yeah, but, you know, I can't be very well be looking back at the screen, you know? Eh? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, I prefer to use my computer. So I'm just, so when I change the slide, it will, you'll, you'll do it. All right, okay. I am at uh, second slide. All right, there you go. I mean, this is technology 2024. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Next slide. I'll do it this way. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think this is working out, okay? <laughs> so, I think we should I'm not seeing any changes up there. Okay. I'm not really impressed, you know? Okay, what should I say, change? Okay. Okay, change that slide. All right, so you should be seeing section one, greenhouse gases and sequestration. Section two, air quality. Section three, water quality and quantity. And four, land remediation. 
course, I skipped out some of these slides. And I see here comprising 376 pages, the text adopts the problems and solutions format such that the reader sees several worked examples following each subtopic in every chapter. Two main themes occur in this book. Are, are, are we together there? <laughs> okay, never, never mind, you, you're, you're hearing. Firstly, the main contributors to climate change are the rise in global warming and greenhouse gas emissions. While certain carbon dioxide emissions account for more than 77% of these changes. Secondly, there is a water problem which comes with global warming. And chapters 18 to 25 addresses that. It discusses water pollution from agricultural practices due to animal wastes, material eroded from the land, uh, plant nutrients, inorganic uh, soils, and minerals resulting from irrigation, herbicides, and pesticides. To these may be added various infectious agents contained in wastes which pollute water with potentially increasing application of pesticides to enlarge crop yields if global warming, warming restricts rainfall. And then again, I use the word if because, you know, this uh, mat matter of global war warming, it, uh, it is pointing to uh, scientific explanations. But uh, if I may just digress a little bit, it's a, it's a bit um, uh, to be taken with a small pinch of salt in some circles. For example, the hurricanes that had been predicted to occur in 2018, they did not come. So it's not something we can predict like a hard and fast two plus two equals four, but we know that by and large, you know, the situation is running out of control. Let, let me go quickly to um, uh, what we have in the first uh, chapter. And historically, historically we have a 7% effect from CO2. That is up to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we, uh, uh, CO2 accounted for 7% of the atmosphere's heat. But we have gone from 280 ppm to now a little over 400 ppm. And that's a ratio of 10 to 7. And when you work that out, uh, it translates to 3 over 7, that fraction of change. And it equals a 3 degree change. All right? Out of the 7 degrees. 3 over 7 is 3 degrees. All right. <clears throat> so it takes time. So why is it that we aren't feeling hotter? <clears throat> why is it that we're not feeling hotter? Because of the sea, the oceans, as you know, water takes a long time to reflect its heat, you know, and the ocean is slow to respond, having enormous capacity for storage. Uh, consequently, the oceans are predicted to rise, and I'm not taking a profit of doom situation now, but I think you have heard all the, the predictions. Uh, drowning much of, the, of Bangladesh, uh, several atolls, the Nile Valley and Louisiana. It won't stabilize until 2300. That's what we're hearing. Now, what I've done in this book, basically, it is not a book meant for, I wouldn't say upper level university. The objective of, of the book was to go by what the two reviewers recommended, problems and solutions. Problems and solutions uh, for workers in the field, like government appointees and others who may not have had the luxury of a higher degree, who can understand the book and apply some of these uh, calculations to, sup to supply the, the needs of their local areas. For example, the first uh, problem uh, I'm going to illustrate this problem 153, CO2 waste, proportions of burning fuels. And this is relevant because 
it says, what are the comparative amounts of CO2 formed by burning a ton each of methane, the main component of natural gas, or ethyl alcohol, or kerosene, and isooctane? Which one of these is going to create the most carbon dioxide? Now, if you're in industry, um, so sorry that, that uh, okay, all right, well, you're seeing this. Uh, well, hope that light wasn't too bright in your eyes, but, you know, it's what we have. Methane, the mole ratio, you can see that equation, and you can see the CH4 is 1, and the CO2 in the right-hand side is 1, so the mole ratio is 1 to 1. But look at ethyl alcohol, the mole ratio is 1 to 2. And for kerosene, the mole ratio is 1 to 11. For isooctane in petrol, the mole ratio is 1 to 8. Now, that's telling us a lot. Now, I know that kerosene uh, uh, is, is, is not by itself the most flammable uh, fuel. But when you think that, you know, we have these great disparities, it's telling us something. Next slide there. Um, all right, let's, let's, let, let, let's move ahead to the total kilograms, uh, about three slides down, to where we have 2,700 kgs for uh, methane. Methane is producing 27, 2.7 tons of CO2 for one ton of methane burnt. And yet methane is widely recognized, you know, the gas you use in your stove at home, as better as CO2, safer, uh, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, desirable than, than many of the others. But yet, that is what we've got. And look at this one. The next slide. Ethyl alcohol is only 723. Kerosene is 3,000. That's three tons per one ton burn. Isooctane is almost the same. So what is that telling us? What is that telling the worker? What is that telling governments? What is that telling them to do? What's telling us all that when we go to fill up our cars with petrol, I will never use E90 because E90 is only 10% alcohol. And alcohol, as you can see, is way by a factor of three times more than that, less CO2. Yes, I know ethyl alcohol is not the most efficient. I know we all know that, but it balances out. The net result is that you're going to put a lot less CO2. And the E90 recommendations, yeah, I, the recommendations there. Next slide. The E90 is 10% alcohol, ethyl alcohol. E70, as you know, 87 is 13%. Okay? So when you rent cars and the renter is telling you, only put E90 in there. They tell me that too. But I just bow my head and then put 87 in there. Okay? So uh, that's the situation there. Um, so these are things that can be done. The man in the street or the woman in the street can do that on an individual basis. The, uh, the book looks at the determinants of CO2 sequestration in forest trees. What kind of forest trees should we be looking at? Those with a high growth rate, high bulk density, wide geographical distribution, strong invasiveness, drought tolerance high, heat tolerance resistance to fire. There's one tree in Jamaica that fits all of that, and it's called the Spathodia campanulata, or um, the flame of the forest, you know? Um, and what I discovered with that tree too, you know, um, is that it's very good pasture a replacement for cattle, okay? I have done that, uh, fed them to cattle. Uh, why I'm saying that? The Amazon is uh, bleeding dry with pastures, okay? And so what I'm saying to you is that individually we could move on instead of having pastures, clearing forests, put the these kinds of trees there, which act as forage for the, and I tell you, I myself, I went to a pasture in Portland, 
and the cows were eating that bad grass, eat, eating down, destroying the pasture. Because when you have them too long, it destroys the pasture. And by accident, I found this out. I was cutting one of these pathodia limbs. And the, the cows saw me cutting that tree, and they moved to the fence. Like, and so I gave them. And would you believe it? it? They just ate it like it was ice cream. Right? And I'm just saying that these are the things that we should be thinking of. Right? I know I'm going almost over time. Right? Okay? But um, I'll, I'll, I'll be finishing shortly. Uh, the next chapter uh, goes along the same. All the chapters follow the same sequence, right? The determinants of CO2, sequestration in water, where we look at salinity. Look at that, please. Determinants of CO2, sequestration in water. Uh, what is keeping it back? You know, I put the is greater sign or is less sign there. Is less, the less salinity you have is the better. The greater depth, the better for sequestration. The lower the pH, the better. Because CO2 dissolved, as you know, rapidly, uh, intensely, at lower pH. The, the, the temperature, as we know, down also. High temperatures don't dissolve it very well. Density, obviously. Greater density, more uh, solution. And less total dissolved solids. So the chapters, as I said, we are, we are basing... Uh, the problems and solutions uh, largely on some of these uh, criterion, criteria so that uh, the person who reads can have a, a, I should say, a very useful um, interpretation and that they can apply it to problems that uh, confront countries, states, towns, and even the local person at home. Thank you very much. And I apologize for not being very happy with situations. You know, everybody knows me as a person who is very volatile, right? But uh, that's just me. I try to stop it, but uh, so I'm just going to live with it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I'd like to present this uh, volume to Dr. President Professor Lincoln Edwards of Northern Caribbean University uh, as a token uh, of uh, solidarity with the problems we face in the world regarding climate change. Thank you very much. NCU is about problem solving. Uh, we, when the nation had that increase in crime, we came up with the rescue program, which is an acronym for restoring every student's confidence using education. And that was our approach to assisting in the problem of crime by ensuring that those persons in the inner cities that had ability but no access could certainly have an opportunity to come to the Northern Caribbean University 
and receive a values-based education that is Christ-centered. And through the rescue program, they, they could matriculate right here and move on and have other choices in life. Global warming is a, is a very uh, serious problem that confronts the world. And certainly, we want to thank Professor Harris by writing this book. He's, he's allowing NCU to contribute to the problem, um, to solutions, providing solutions to solving, helping to solve global warming. So, Professor Harris, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate this. And NCU celebrates you for writing this volume. Thank you. Yes, and that is a fitting way for us to end the first session of the Science Symposium. We're going to be breaking at this time for lunch. Um, there's a cafeteria up on the campus, and um, I know there will be a special lunch for the um, presenters and faculty over by the Thai Center. Um, and we'll be resuming our symposium discussions at 1 p.m. It is now about 12.15, so we are a little bit out over time, but we are, we'll be back on track <laughs> by this afternoon. So um, we'll break now for lunch. Just an announcement before we go. There is a booth at the back, Jamaica Labs, that um, markets and sells laboratory equipment. Um, so if you wanted to have a look there, I didn't mention them earlier on when I was mentioning the posters. Uh, I think that is it for today. Um, so we'll be resuming back here at 1 p.m. So please come back, and we look forward to seeing you back here in the afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>